Well, hey guys, I got a little story here for you. I was putzing around. I found something about the East Harlem Purple Gang. Now, there was a Purple Gang in Detroit. I believe it was mainly Jewish guys during Prohibition. And but in more recent times, we have the East Harlem Purple Gang. It was primarily Italian American hitmen and heroin dealers. Were independent from the Italian American mafia, the normal mafia. They had their own little gang. They named themselves after the original Purple Gang. The, you know, these guys that got together from Pleasant Avenue, they said. I read that uh, Al Pacino mentioned that Pleasant Avenue crew, and he was referring to, to this group of guys as mainly in the 1970s and the 80s. They developed close ties with the Genovese family, uh, primarily because they were drug dealers, I think, and the Genovese family is, and the Bonanno family, too. But Genovese he always, you know, accountants the sale of heroin. So he was, uh, they were really close to the Genovese family, 116th Street crew, is, is what I read. Now, of course, they started out as a youth street gang, as a lot of these people do, all the way back to the turn of the century. They started out as these youth street gangs, and they get involved in robberies and assaults. And, and then as they get older, they always go into more organized criminal activity. activity. And, and you know, the the best criminal activity that needs organization is narcotics, and that pays the most money. And since they weren't really connected, they weren't made men, they weren't trying to be made men, they just wanted to make money and and be tough on the street, I got a feeling, and have all the accoutrements of uh, in a successful gangster, you know, a Cadillac, a fancy car, and, and nice clothes. Well, they got into the narcotics business, of course, and it started out as delivery boys and spotters and lookouts for other narcotics dealers, especially for some of the established uh, Italian mafia dudes that were uh, in the drug trade, you know, during this time, Carmine Galente, and and he had his zips over here from Sicily, and and they had a huge drug trade going, and, and they got involved with them, and 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 they slowly but surely rose to power in up in Harlem in the drug traffic. In 1973, there was a lot of arrest of high-ranking mafioso and the French connection, if you remember that, and. Uh, that was Louis Inglese and Lucchese boss Carmine Tramonte. You know, this created a vacuum. And, you know, anytime there's a vacuum, a vacuum needs to be filled. And the Purple Gang stepped right in and, and filled that with the drug trade in East Harlem and, and dominated it for the next few years and, and didn't really let anybody else come in. And they were the major independent drug, drug distributors outside of the New York's five families. Uh, of course, goes along with drug dealing is kidnapping rival drug dealers for ransom, robbing rival drug dealers, their own drug trafficking. Murder is, is a form of, you got somebody that steals from it, you know, just go out and murder them. And loan sharking, because you're going to get all this cash coming in, and, and now that you've got all these guys working with you, you know, you go into extortion and, and even some labor racketeering and and at least acting on the, for the be on behalf of one of the five families, it's kind of like uh, I believe it was Gambino family used the Westies to do a lot of their their heavy work, and, and so the Purple Gang uh, was used by some other of uh, the different uh, Italian American mafia gangs to do some of their dirty work. And of course, I'm sure that they probably kicked some money every once in a while to some of these guys. They did get connected up and. They actually became the suppliers of heroin to Leroy Barnes and, and his network, which was huge. Leroy Barnes was the top heroin dealer in Harlem. And, and they say that he was selling it for as much of as they say the Purple Gang was selling it to these African-American dealers for as much as $75,000 for a kilo. That's a lot of money for a kilo of heroin, like a kilo of of cocaine, and most I ever knew it was going for was like twenty, twenty-five thousand here in Kansas City. But I think heroin must uh, supply law and supply and demand, and I always heard that heroin is a lot more than than cocaine. Of course, they continued to become more and more involved with murders. They got these young guys in, and and they'd act as contract killers for the mafia. They really became well known for what what was I read was an enormous capacity for violence. <laughs> uh, law enforcement would claim at one time that the Purple Gang did as many as 17 homicides, mainly for the mafia. And a lot of the, these guys were, a lot of their murders were grisly. Right? Some involved in decapitation and dismemberment and multiple stab wounds. Now, I, I don't know. I mean, 
this is throughout the mob. I don't know if they were any more in Grizzly. I think of some of these guys in Chicago, they had the Calabrese necktie where uh, he might shoot a guy and then cut his throat and then maybe pull his tongue down through outside out of his mouth down into his throat. I mean, those guys at Calabrese Cruise <laughs> was uh, pretty ra- rugged too. Rice of killings during the 1970s and they all took place with a 22 caliber firearm. And the 22 caliber killings became known as the trademark of the Purple Gang. So in Kansas City, in the Midwest, 22 caliber killings was really the mark of the Chicago outfit all the way out to the West Coast. There's several hits out in Las Vegas and down in uh, Southern California, even killed a woman out there who was getting involved, was was threatening the uh, casino skim and, and killed her with a twenty two caliber. Sam Giancana was killed with a twenty two caliber and a bunch of other murders happened in Chicago with a twenty two caliber. Twenty two caliber is really good. It's it, it has such a, a low sound Put a, put a silencer and you don't even have to have a great silencer on top of a, a 22 caliber and get one of those Rugers that's got about 14 shells in it. Well, you can, you can really pepper somebody with that. And the first couple don't do it. You can just keep shooting them without having to reload. So these guys, uh, they, they refine the, the art of, of murder, I'd say, and using it as a, as a message in New York City. What I read, the peak of their strength, Around 1977, had around 30 members and, and what they called associates, a bunch of associates, many, maybe as many as a hundred. So it was, it was getting to be a pretty good sized gang. Of course, this is New York. Many people in the mob, the, the La Cosa Nostra mafia thought these young guys were too reckless and uncontrollable and didn't really want to bring them any close. Now they didn't mind using them. They didn't mind making money off of them. But they didn't want to bring them in too close. They, they just felt like the, the established five families had some rules and they were afraid these guys wouldn't, uh, wouldn't follow the rules. You know, like I said, they were used as muscle and hitmen for, for most of the families whenever it suited their purpose. They even sent them up to, to Monroe, New York, upstate New York in private sanitation business dispute and they ended up assaulting a whole bunch of private sanitation workers whenever the new york mob was probably but Polly walnuts maybe was trying to move in on somebody's uh trash routes and and you know they they do that they, they find a trash route and they'll they'll just use every any means possible to push out any competition they did still maintain this reputation as they really did not show the proper respect for members of la cosa nostra mafia and, and you know one of the huge rule is you don't put your hands on a made guy you don't mess with a made guy's woman or her sister or his mother or anything to do with somebody that's married or in a made guy's family and and they didn't show the proper respect for that when they as they got big some people even referred to them as new york six family i i don't know i imagine the mob guys didn't really like that they had that, there was some fear that they might there might be a war between uh, carmen galente when he was in charge of the banano crime family i don't know but there was there was some fear of that cocaine came in in the late 70s there was so much there's a flood of cocaine you know they developed a relationship down in south america and central america as a matter of fact the purple gang guys got involved with some nicaraguan drug dealers started trading firearms for drugs you know they do that down in mexico down through texas and you can uh, uh you know you get a whole bunch of guns and you can trade them for drugs and it's you can make a pretty good trade as a matter of fact that's what that whole fast and furious thing that the atf got in trouble was about was they were trying to trace these guns that were bought in american drug uh, gun stores down in the Mexico and see what happened to him. And one got used in some kind of a murder and then it got traced back and the whole thing it was a, it was ill advised, uh, operation at best. But this all, these firearms were sent to Latin American narco terrorists through connections they had in Florida. And then in return, they had access to the cocaine out of Colombia and they would bring the cocaine back up. They also had ties to the Cuban mafia in Florida. So had pretty good ties down in Florida. As they got uh, more successful and older and into the 1980s, they ended up getting absorbed into the Genovese crime family and the 116th Street crew. And some members were even invited to become made men. 
uh, there was two of them, Angelo Prisco and Daniel Leo, who would go on to be the acting boss of the Genovese family in 2005. When a guy named Michael Mancuso supposedly became the boss of the Bonanno family, he came out of the Purple Gang. One of the latter murders of the remnants of the leader of the gang, a guy named Michael Meldish, had been a leader of the Purple Gang. And he was killed by Lucchese acting boss, Matthew Madonna. And he was, they killed him in Throg's neck. A guy named Christopher Londonio and Terrence Caldwell did it. And they used a peckerwood in that one as well as one Italian guy. The three who did it were sentenced to life in prison for that murder on July 27, 2020. So that was kind of the end of the Purple Gang. Not the Purple Gang of Detroit, the Purple Gang of New York City, and not the Purple Gang of the Prohibition era, but the Purple Gang of the Narcotics era, 1980s, 70s, and 80s, when narcotics was king, not illegal booze. So thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate y'all watching or listening. And don't forget, I ride motorcycles, so... Watch out for motorcycles when you're out there riding. And if you have a problem or you know somebody has a problem with PTSD, and if you're a vet, go to the VA website and find that hotline. You can get some help there. Thanks a lot, guys. Get some help.